Take your Bibles, if you would, this morning. 1 Kings chapter 20. 1 Kings chapter 20. And you find your spot, if you would, if you're able to stand for the reading of God's Word. I begin reading in verse uh, uh, 22. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 22. I do want to thank everybody too as well for all the food and that was gathered up uh, yesterday to take out to um, uh, the Jones family and continue to pray for them. Uh, it was nice to see those that came to uh, support the family yesterday at, at Jimmy's uh, memorial service. I am thankful that the funeral guy allowed us to go inside because it was rather... <laughs> It was rather chilly out there yesterday, and he, he walked up to me, and he said, you mind if we do this inside? And I said, no, sir, I'm not going to object. I'll be inside. will be good. But it, it, was, it was nice to uh, very, uh, the, the military, he had the military honors, and uh, just continue to pray for the family as now everybody will uh, disappear, and they'll go back to their homes. And uh, as I prayed yesterday, just pray the Holy Spirit would fill the void uh, that's that's going to be there in the house. Notice, if you would, verse 22. 1 Kings 20, verse 22, And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said to him, Go strengthen thyself and mark and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come against thee. And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Uh, therefore, they were stronger than we, we go back to the first of the chapter, there was a battle and it was in the mountains and, and Israel won. And now there's another Syrian campaign with Ahab. So verse 23 says, And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are, are gods of the hills, therefore they were stronger than we, but let us fight them in the plain or down in the valley, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And do this thing, take the kings away, every man out of his place, uh, put captains in the rooms and number thee an army like the army that thou ha has lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we will be stronger uh, than they. And he hearkened unto their voice and did so. And it came to pass at the return of the year that Ben-Hadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. And there came a, a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore I will deliver all this great multitude into thy hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And they pitched uh, one over against the other seven days, and so it was that in the seventh day the battle was joined, and the children of Israel slew of the Syrians a hundred thousand footmen in one day. I want to preach a message I just have simply entitled it, God Has No Limitations. God has no limitations. Heavenly Father, I love you and thank you so much for loving us. I thank you for your word. Thank you for directing me uh, to this portion of scripture because, Lord, we do know that you are the God of the mountain, but you are also the God of the valley as well. And I, I am grateful today. There's nothing too hard for you. There there's nothing that's impossible for you. And Lord, I just pray that you'd strengthen our hearts. Use the word of God. Please hide me behind the cross. I, I yield myself to you the best way I know how. Lord, strengthen us today. We love you. I, I, I praise you for what you're going to do in our midst. Again, thank you for binding the devil from us. We love you. And we praise you for what you're going to do in our midst. And I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. You know, the passage we before us today finds Israel in a... Uh, it, it was really dangerous times. Ahab, we, we know about Ahab and, and, and the wickedness. He was, he was uh, wicked would be a good word to describe him. I could probably think of uh, different adjectives, but he was guilty of leading the children of Israel 
uh, to worship the Canaanite god of Baal instead of, uh, of the Lord. And as a result, wickedness permeated the land of Israel. And they were on a collision course, if you will, with the, the judgment of God. But even in the midst of their sins, and, and here's one thing that I, I enjoy as a child of God, even in the midst of your sin, God still loves you. He's going to chasten you, but he still loves you because Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 3 says he loves us with an everlasting love. One thing uh, you can take heart to uh, today is God's love will never change. It will never fail. But during this time, Israel was attacked by the Syrians who were their, their neighbor to the east. That was the beginning of the chapter. And when this battle was finished, God allowed Ahab and the children of Israel to uh, defeat uh, the Syrians and, and to claim the victory. But in verse 22, we're reminded that Ahab is notified that, uh, you know, the, the Syrians aren't going to accept defeat uh, so easily. And he's told, that, look, they're, they're, they're going to come back. They're going to regroup and they're, they're going to come back to fight once again. And uh, it's the second battle that I want us to look into, the verses that we read, uh, because there's truths here that will help us all on, on the journeys that we walk uh, for the Lord in the days that we live in. And I just want to say this, in this chapter, we can see, make, to make this applicable for, for us, the Syrian army is, is kind of a, a picture of the devil, He's a roaring lion who seeketh whom he may devour. And uh, he's out. The, the devil is always out. Satan is always out to, to get the children of God. And uh, when we're enabled by the Lord to, to be victorious uh, against the wiles of the devil, you, you can count on him to come back. He's not just going to leave us alone. And he wants to have us defeated. He wants us to live uh, non-victorious lives for Christ. He wants to render us uh, useless for the cause of Christ. And, and, and I, I, I've learned over the years that if he can't get you in one area of your life, what does he do? He moves to another area of your life. And he'll keep moving and moving and moving until he can get his foot in the door. And once he gets his foot in the door, he will uh, wreak havoc. And uh, he will change the direction and, and he'll come at us constantly. First Peter, I quoted it a while ago, be sober. This is what Peter says. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, uh, walketh about seeking whom he may uh, devour and... Uh, this is just what the Syrian army did to the children of Israel. But just as the Syrians were defeated and, and Israel walked in, in victory, I want to let you know this morning, and, and I was reminded this morning, we can walk in victory. I can't have a, a victorious Christian life. And I want to notice, uh, all of us to notice, there's some truths here that will help us in Yes, God is a God on the mountains. But you know, He's still God even when you can't see your path and when everything seems to be closing in on you. And he, he, he's, he's a God that has no limitations. And, and I can, can dogmatically say amen to that. Verse 23, we see a, uh, the Syrians had a dangerous assumption. They... They, they had a dangerous assumption uh, about the God of the, the Israelites. And they, this is their assumption. Since they were defeated in the first battle on the hills that were surrounding Samaria, they, they assumed that God was just a, a God on the mountains and, and that only. And he, okay, so let's, let's get them in the plane. Let's let them see all our chariots. Let, let them see all our our, our people, and the Bible even tells us that Israel looked like two little flocks. I mean, Israel compared to the Syrians, uh, but they thought in their mind that they could easily defeat them in the plain. And, you know, this was a very costly uh, uh, assumption. But you know what? It's a gamble the devil makes all the time in our lives. You see, when we're on the mountain spiritually, when, when, what I mean by it, when we're in tune with God, 
You know what I'm referring to when uh, uh, we're claiming the promises of God and, and we're, we're doing what God wants us to do when we're walking around and we have a, a, a song in our heart and there's a shout on our lips. And, and the devil has a hard time with us. And the reason why he has a hard time with us is because we're, we're walking and living out the promises of God and we're claiming the promises of God. And, and Satan is no match for, thus saith the Lord. He's no match for the word of God. Now, I'm no match for him by myself. But if I use the word of God and it, 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 Satan is hard to uh, it's hard for Satan to defeat. Would you not agree? It, it's hard to defeat an excited Christian. He can get a discouraged Christian. He can get a depressed Christian. But it's hard to to get a, a defeat because as Nehemiah said, it's the joy of the Lord in Nehemiah 810. That is our strength and that's the situation, matter of fact, that the devil ran into with, with Job. God allowed things to happen in, in Job's life. And could you say that Job was being battled on the plain? Job was down in a valley with everything happened. And the Bible says in Job chapter 1, verse 14, you don't have to turn there. He says, and there came a messenger. In verse 16, while he was yet speaking. Verse 17, while he was yet speaking. In verse 18, while he was yet speaking. And all this came at Job all at once. And he was bombarded by the devil. Notice what Job said. In verse 20, then Job arose and ran his mantle and shaved his head and fell down to, upon the ground and worshipped. And said, naked came I out of my mother's womb. And naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He was praising God down in the valley. He was praising God in the plain. And the Bible says, in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. He won the valley. He, he won in the valley. He won the, the battle. And you, you have to understand, the devil, when he squeezes you, when he squeezes you and he squeezed Job, what did he get out of Job? Worship and praise. In all this, Job didn't charge God foolishly, the Bible says. So when he squeezes us and all he gets is praise to God for his efforts, uh, he'll flee for a season. He, uh, he'll more than likely stop squeezing after a while. And uh, I, I read an illustration about uh, the devil having a, a tool sale, if, if there was such a thing. And uh, on the date of the sale, there were tools placed in uh, out on a table for public inspection, and, and each one had a, a, a price on them. And there were a lot of dangerous tools, uh, the hatred and envy and jealousy and doubt and lying, pride, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, apart from them, on the table was a tool that was laid out uh, by itself. It was a harmless-looking tool, but it was, it, it was well-worn and very high-priced. And one man asked, what is the name of that tool? And the adversary said, that's discouragement. And he said, why have you priced it so high? And he said, because it's more useful to me uh, than all the other tools. I can pry open it and get, get inside a person's heart with, with this one and where I cannot get close to them with no other tool. And once I'm inside, I can do as I want. And it's a badly worn tool because I use it on everybody that I know. The devil's price for discouragement was so high he never sold it you know it's his still it's his major tool that he uses today if we would just be uh, honest about it and it's been said that discouragement is, is the the uh, handle that fits all the devil's tools and but satan knows when we're on top of the mountain and we see that here with the syrians it, you, you can't we're no match so he wants to get us into the valley. When I have a promise on my mouth and a song in my heart, and even though I'm sad and I mean, rather rejoiceful when I'm on the mountain, God, God, I know God is big. I know God is huge, and, and he's helped me before, and I'm rejoicing. It's, it's hard for Satan to get me there. It really is, but we have to be careful because when we get in the valley, that's where uh, we have that woe is me mentality, and we... we Man, we open the door for him. And, and if the devil can get us to focus, here's the thing. If he can get us to focus on, on any negative aspect of any situation, do you realize he can discourage you? Doesn't take much. If he can get you discouraged, he can get you 
uh, uh, defeated. And if he can get you defeated, he can steal the joy. He can steal uh, the victory that uh, the Lord has given us. And, uh, you know, life is, is this. It's ten, it, life is 10% about what happens to us and 90% of how we react to things. There again, if we would learn just to put in Bible principles, I, I, that's the best. Turn with me, if you would hold your spot there, turn with me uh, one set of verses I, that helped me a lot. And I think Philippians chapter 4, I'm sorry. Uh, I was going to read them to you, but turn, turn over there with me. I don't want to have the woe is me attitude uh, concerning life's uh, events. And I, I don't want to be, and I, I remember asking my preacher years ago, uh, yeah, it's easy to battle him when I'm on top of everything and, and, and I'm, things are going well and I'm on the mountain and he tries to come at me and throw darts and I can deflect them off because I put on the whole armor of God. And, and, but when we're in the valley, we, we tend to forget things and we, we just because that's our human nature. And, and I asked preacher one time, I said, how can I stop from being easy prey? He took me here. He, he said, Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, he, well, verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. That's one way. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. But here's where I wanted to get to. These were the verses that, that were given to me many times when I felt that I, I was at loss and I was in the valley. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, Think on these things, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. Do Under, underline that do we want us to think on these things, but do them. And the God of peace shall be with you. So the question we need to ask or the question I'll ask, has the devil tried this trap of discouragement on us? Has he used that tool? Uh, on our lives and many of us could say yes he, he has tried and uh, I know he's done it on me and, and I, I, I don't dare want to give him any credit but uh, discouragement works better on most people than any other tool if he can just get us off the mountaintop he knows that he he can trip us up for good the Syrian armies made a a, a dangerous assumption about the God of, of heaven. And the second thing in verse 28, back in our text, we see a, a, a really a, a dynamic uh, announcement. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is a God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thy hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. See, what the Syrians didn't know, God was way greater than anything that they could even imagine how great he was. So he sends his prophet to tell Ahab uh, that he's going to prove himself to be the God in the plain, the, the God of the valley, just as well as the God on the mountain. In verse 28, he assures them of the victory. Has he not assured us? Of the victory, child of God? Sure he has. And I want to remind you that God is bigger uh, than our, our valleys. And, and I know, again, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it's easy to get excited about the Lord. It's, it's easy to get excited about the Lord's work when we're on the mountaintop. But when we get into the valleys of, of life, you know, God's still a, a, a big God. He's still huge. And he, when we enter the, the valley of pain, God is, is still God. When we enter the valley of, of spiritual 
spiritual uh, discouragement or even a spiritual uh, depression. He's still God. The valley of sorrow, it doesn't matter what valley we're forced to enter into. Child of God, he's still God. He's bigger than anything that we can uh, um, go up against. And he wants to demonstrate that to us regardless of what stage of life that we're in. We're all in different stages of life. We're all in different walks in our Christian life. But he wants you to know he's still God. And the Bible, my goodness, the Bible is is literally filled with promise after promise after promise that teaches that God is in control. Verses like Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are called, to them who are called according to his purpose. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians uh, 2, 14. Now, thanks be unto God which also, also always causes us to triumph in Christ and make us uh, the manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Here's another one, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For our light affliction is but for a moment working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And these verses, you know, tell us, they demonstrate us to us that, that God is, is he's powerful in any situation. Now, there's many more that I can give you. But we just have to realize that when we come to understand that Satan wants to defeat us and that's his sole purpose. And, and, and all I have to do is claim God's promises and walk in God's promises. I can have, you know, regardless of what we go through, we can still live in victory. Because of the promises of God. When everything around us suggests that we should be discouraged and give up and, and be defeated, God still says we are victors. Romans chapter 8, verse 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than what? Do we live like we're conquerors? We do when we're on the mountain. But do we live like that when we're down in the valley? Because we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And, and in the final analysis, genuine spiritual victory is... Never of what I'm facing in life. Genuine spiritual victory is simple faith. Simple faith in the promises of God. If I want to have victory in my life today over whatever, it's just trusting God at His word. It's taking God at His word. And I'm victorious not because everything's perfect in my life, because that's not the case. I'm victorious because God is in control of my life, and He says that I'm a victor. He says that I'm more than a conqueror. So regardless of the situation, can I claim the promise of God? Can I walk in the strength of the Lord? Can I be led by the Holy Spirit of God and be victorious and have the devil flee from me? Does not the Bible tell us to resist? So how do we resist? That's a rhetorical question, isn't it? How do I resist him? With the word of God. How, how did he resist uh, Satan in the, in the wilderness? Thus saith the Lord. We, we do it the same way. And, and while I, I am in the battle, the thing about it, God, and I've tried to make myself think, God's already won the war. I may be in a battle, but he won the war, and, and I'm victorious whether I think I'm victorious or not. And I'm not talking about positive thinking or, or possibility thinking or, or some other uh, heretical teaching. Uh, I'm promoting God's word. What you hold in your laps is powerful. This is powerful. And we have it at our disposal. And all we have to do to, to live and be victorious and have a, a, a song in our heart. You can have a song in your heart when you're sad. When you can have a song in your heart when you don't know what tomorrow is going to be like. Because he has already gone before us. More than anything else, the path out of the valley just... Begins with the, the us surrendering to God. Lord, you help me. You, you guide me. Fanny Crosby. Many of you know that she was blind since her childhood. She lived to be 95 years old. Uh, I read this one time. She penned a, a poem at age eight. Oh, what a happy soul am I. Although I cannot see, I'm resolved that in this world contented I will be. 
How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. Blind but happy was the title of that little poem that she wrote at the age of eight. But in verse 29, we see this uh, miraculous accomplishment. I, 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 I've titled it a divine accomplishment. The children of Israel believed God and they uh, enjoyed a tremendous victory over the Syrian army. And they saw their enemy uh, run uh, from the power of God working through them. And, and this is the place, again, child of God, this is the place where God wants to bring us to. He wants us to come to a place where we realize that He is God. Regardless of what we're facing, He's, he's still God. And He wants us to get our, our eyes off of our need. How many times in our life when we're going through something, we start looking at the circumstances and stop looking at God? Peter was good when he got out of the boat. He had enough faith to get out of the boat. And he got out of the boat and he walked on water until he did what? He looked at the waves and saw the wind and the waves. And the Bible tells us to look unto Jesus. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. and A verse we should all commit to memory. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly all above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. So regardless of what I'm facing, regardless of what I'm going to face tomorrow, God has already gone before me. See, that's the thing that we, we, we think we're on our own. Okay, today, He's with me today, and He's going to help me today, and, and then we fret over tomorrow. We, we fret the unknown. But He's already gone before us, and He's going to be with us. And Shame on us when we don't think that God's big enough to help us tomorrow. A recently retired man was sitting on the porch in his rural Kentucky home. The mailman came and delivered his Social Security check. And he got up and went to the mailbox and he thought to himself, is this what my life has come to, just waiting on my Social Security check to come? And he was sitting there waiting and he, he was discouraged. So he sat there and he took out a legal pad and he began to write down all his gifts, his blessings, all his talents, everything that he had uh, going for him. And he, he listed everything on the list while he sat on that front porch, even the small things. And he also remembered that he was the only one that in his family that knew his mother's recipe for fried chicken and that she had to use 11 different uh, herbs and spices. So he went down to the local restaurant and asked them if he could cook his mama's chicken. And his chicken became uh, the, the greatest chicken in the restaurant there. And he ended up opening up a, a string of restaurants and eventually sold a, the chain of Kentucky Fried Chicken for millions of, of dollars. He became their public representative and continued the role until his death. And the man who refused to accept defeat at, a, at an older age is the man that has that building that's right over there that you smell every time you walk out of the doors is Kentucky Fried Chicken is, is uh, Colonel Harlan Sanders. You know, when we trust God, that's where the victory is enjoyed. I didn't say won. The victory is enjoyed because God has won all our victories. When we live in defeat and discouragement, it's, it's because we refuse to embrace His victory by faith. See, the Bible says to just shall live by faith. How many times do we want to live by sight? And therefore, we don't have the victory. Child of God, never allow Satan or the flesh. And I've been there. Have you ever wallowed in the valley? I think we're all guilty of that. And when we wallow in the valley, we, be, we get discouraged. And, and, you know, that discouragement and that defeat causes us to think. I hate to even say this, but it's true. I don't think God can handle my situation. And sometimes we may not come out and say that audibly. There you go, Danny. By our actions, we prove that to be true. 
Because we know Satan, he, he can only hear us audible, so we're, we're going to be smart, and we're not going to verbalize things right. But yet, we're, our actions are, are so detrimental to our, our life. Victory is available to us uh, at all times, in every situation, and uh, we just... We just need to claim the victory. They claim the victory. Think for a minute. I, I, I thought about this yesterday. I, even Friday, I was thinking about this message and thinking about God has no limitations. There's nothing. New Testament tells us there's for with God, nothing shall be impossible. In Matthew chapter 28, it says all power. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. A Amen. But think about Joshua and Caleb in, in, in Numbers chapter 13. If anybody had a, a, a reason to get discouraged or, or, or be defeated, it would have been them two when the spies were sent out and they came back and everybody's saying, oh, they're like giants and, and we can't go. But yet what Joshua and Caleb tell them, they said, no, there's a land flowing with milk and honey and, and let's, let's go in and, and, and take over. But you had all these other people saying, no, no, we, we can't do it. But what happened? God gave them the victory because they claimed the word of God. David, my goodness, is there not a cause? Everybody was on the mountaintop worried about Goliath and the little ruddy boy went down there and took care of things. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood when nobody else would stand. How could they do that? They had the promises of God. Yeah, God's going to deliver us, is what they told Nebuchadnezzar. If you, even if you throw us in the fire, he's still going to deliver us. And, and that's a promise. There are many other instances that I, I could say tonight but, or this morning, but the, these are sufficient. It doesn't matter, and I, I have to tell myself there, it doesn't matter what it looks like on the surface. We have to understand that irregardless... It may look just totally despairing, but God's still in control. Do you believe that? Do I believe that? You know, when I think about God has no limitations, I, I, I have no way of knowing what, what everybody is completely facing this morning in their life. I know some things. I'm privy of some things. But one thing I am assured of may be that the devil is using the tool of discouragement in somebody's life. Maybe it's depression. Or maybe you feel like you're defeated and God's a million miles away from you. I just want to remind you one more time that the God that was with you when you were on the mountaintop is the same God that's with you right now in the valley. And he has obligated himself. I, I will never, ever, 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 ever get tired of saying that. He, when I became a child of God, he obligated himself to take care of me. And he said he would see me through. And he's going to see me through. The church, the bride, is going to be presented to the Father one day spotless. And the secret of enjoying the mountain and the valley is it's, it's simply this. Here's the message. Learning that God is in control. No matter what it is, God's in control. See, we have it up here. Theologically, we understand that, that God is the God of the universe. He spoke everything to in existence, and he holds the very breath that we breathe. But why do we think for one minute he can't handle this little minute situation that's going on in my life? Because we give in to the wiles of the devil. And, and, and here's another thing. We're not ignorant of his devices. If we could just trust him, learn, we'll be a hard nut to crack for the devil. I... I the first step in arriving at the place is, is, okay, when I have a problem, sure, I like to share things with my wife, but there's sometimes there's, there's things that it's just like, all I'm going to do is burden her down. So what do I do? Who do I go to? The Bible says in, in, in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you, right? That's the example we have from 
from Peter, but there's a lot of New Testament promises that were given to us from Old Testament verses. 1 Peter 5, 7 was uh, used by Peter, but he was just restating David's words in Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Do you have a burden too, too big to bear? Why not just take time, do what the Bible says to do. Cast your burdens on him. Cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. But what do we do? I'll sit there in the pew and the Lord will convict me about something and, and I, I, I'll, I'll give it to him. At least I think I give it to him. If I come here, I'm going to go to the altar and, and that'll make it a little bit more special because there's, there's it's just something about going to the altar and giving our burdens to the Lord. But you know what we always do? I, maybe it's just me. Pick it right back up. Instead of really truly, okay, Lord, I, I, I can't do it. But you know what? He will put you in a situation to where you can't do it. And you have to trust him. And then when you do fully trust him, he will move mountains. He will move uh, all your mountains out of the way. And, and he will lift you out of the valley. And he'll set you upon the rock. And that rock is Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness and grace. Uh, I am so thankful after everything that we've talked about that you are the God of the mountain, but you are still the God in the valley. And we see this in this simple little uh, account in the Bible with King Ahab and Syria and the children of Israel. And Lord, I, I pray that if the devil has somebody bound up today, that this would be the day that they would claim a promise of God and rebuke the devil with it and trust you. To lift them up out of the valley and put them back, put a song back in their heart, joy back in their step. Lord, I am thankful. No matter what goes on in my life, I, I'm, I'm a conqueror. I, I'm victorious. And it's not because of me, it's because I'm your child. I love you. Have your will and your way in the invitation. Help your children today, Lord. And I ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.